Hey, well, good morning, church. Let's go ahead and stand up and worship together and give our God praise this morning because he's worthy of it. Amen. Come on, let's put our hands together. Your presence there is true. Yeah. In your presence. 
or forsake us. God, your plans for us, God, are wildly better than anything we could ever imagine for ourselves. So God, I pray that this morning as each of us come in today that we could experience you and encounter you. God, in your fullness and who you are. Because, God, because you are worthy. And God, we are so unworthy. So God, let us just bring everything that we come into these doors with and just lay them at your feet, God. God, so we can come here and solely focus on you and who you are, God. When we worship, we can just put the distractions aside and just focus on you and giving you the praise that you deserve, God. God, allow us to, to tune our hearts into you this morning. And God, to just become closer to you and hear whatever it is that you have for us today. So God, we love you in your name. Amen. Yes, we see it. Good morning, Stonehill. Man, we are excited that you are here with us this morning. My name is Eric. This is Laura, and we're just thrilled that you are joining us. If you're tuning in online, uh, would you go to our website, click the connect button, let us know that you're here with us, or drop a comment in the chat. Um, everyone else in person here, I want to invite you to pull out your connect card. Would love it if you would fill this out. Let us know you're here. Write down some prayer requests. We want to pray for you this week. Uh, maybe some praises. Maybe God's doing some cool things in your life. Write those down as well. And if you are brand brand new with us, fill this out after the service, take it out to our guest services tent where we have a free gift for you. I'd love to be able to just shake your hand, get to know you. Yes, and Easter is just around the corner. This is one of our favorite times of the year here at Stonehill. It's a great opportunity for you guys to invite your friends and neighbors and coworkers out to one of our services. We actually have four services for you guys this year, Saturday the 8th at 5 p.m. and then Easter Sunday at 8 a.m., 9.30 a.m. and then 11 a.m. And just because it's so busy and we wanna make room, if you can, try to attend this Saturday evening session at 5 p.m. or Sunday morning at 8 a.m. And these are gonna be a big, big weekend. A lot of people coming through our doors. So this is what we're also asking you to do. Uh, please, can you help us serve? You can check the box on the Connect card. We need some help serving kids ministry, uh, first impressions, various roles. Um, and this is a one-time commitment. We're not asking you to sign up for the whole year, but if you could help us out on this weekend, we're gonna have a lot of guests coming through the doors. So go ahead and check that box and we'll get you plugged in. Yes, and each year, 20,000 um, foster kids are aged out of the foster care program within the United States. And this leaves a lot of them jobless and homeless. And so Gem Friends is here today with a booth in the lobby to shine some light on that. They're a nonprofit organization that help these youth find jobs and living situations and to become more independent. So if you'd like more information about that, feel free to swing by their booth outside. Absolutely, and we're continuing in our series in the book of Daniel. So if you want to pull out your Bibles or open up the Stonehill app, we are going to be in Daniel chapter 7. So let's get ready for this message. Church, how are you guys doing this morning? Yeah, you're like half the people that usually go to the 930, but you slept in because you lost an hour of sleep. But we're glad to have you here. Uh, my name's Kason. I'm the Creative Arts Director here at Stonehill. And if you've been coming for a short time, you've probably never seen me preach. And uh, that's because I don't preach a whole lot. I was asked to fill in uh, kind of last minute. Um, for many of you, you know this, but our lead pastor, uh, Doug, his mom went to be with Jesus this last week. 
Um, so I get the opportunity to be here with you guys, but I want to take a moment this morning and something we don't do very well in our culture is, is honor those who have laid a foundation for us. And so I want to take a moment this morning and pray for Doug's family to honor them and lift them up. Will you guys join me in that? All right. Uh, God, just want to say thank you uh, for the Connollys. Thank you for uh, the impact they've had in your kingdom uh, through their many years of ministry, for the sacrifices that they've made, um, God, for what they've created here at Stonehill, what you've done through them. And uh, God, just ask an immense amount of peace in this season as, as they remember uh, Doug's mom as they have the opportunity to celebrate the good news that she is with you, that she has eternal life in you. And uh, Father, we thank you for that. Um, but there's also uh, the reality that there is still so much to deal with here and the pain and the sorrow that goes with that. And so we just ask for your peace in their life, um, God, that you would continue just to use their family in a mighty way to reach your kingdom. Um, and God, that uh, these next couple weeks or months as they process this, um, God, that they would find a peace in you that can only come from you. And uh, God, we just thank you for uh, what you've done through them. We thank you for their friendship and their leadership. And so God, we love you. We pray this in your son's name. Amen. Amen. Well, uh, this week we continue in our series, Daniel. And for many of you uh, who know Daniel very well, we're in chapter seven, so you can go ahead and turn your Bibles there. But you know that Daniel chapter 7 takes a hard right turn. So uh, it gets a little weird this week. We're going to be talking about the end times prophecy. Dun, 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 right? Like, how many of you people know people who like love end time prophecy? Like, you can raise your hand. If you love end time prophecy, you can raise your hand. You know that these people get like absolutely crazy about it, right? Like, they go from, I've known people who know nothing about their Bible hardly, like new believers, but they're like, as soon as it becomes anything about end time prophecy, they become like a PhD in it. Like, it's crazy. This is one of those areas that people either absolutely love or they try to stay away from altogether. And I became a Christian in the early 2000s when the Left Behind series came out. How many of you know Left Behind? Someone just said, yeah, to Left Behind. I'm not going to point you out, but here's... Here's, here's what Left Behind is, for those of you who don't know. Left Behind was this series of books that came out with someone's interpretation of the end times, how it would be fulfilled. And um, Kirk Cameron was in the movies. Yeah, it was terrible. And, um, but I had just become a Christian, and that's like all everyone talked about in the church I grew up in. They were like obsessed when these things were going to be fulfilled. I, I'm telling you, for the first few years of being a Christian, I thought Nikolai Carpathia, which is who Satan was in there, was the actual Antichrist. Like that that's, there was going to be a guy named Nikolai Carpathia, and that's who was going to be the Antichrist. And so um, people just get wild about this. And so what I'm going to ask from you guys today is this one easy thing, okay? As we read through Daniel's vision, as we read through this next section of scripture, let's just not get weird, okay? Like, it's really easy to get weird about this. And what I'm hoping that we're able to do today is just to walk through this vision. We're gonna take it as is. We're gonna look at uh, the different beasts that are talked about here. And really the goal is to bring light as to why, uh, this, is, why this is being prophesied about, what it meant for them back then and what it means for us today, okay? So can you guys do that for me, not get weird today? We good? Uh, in Daniel 7, we're going to start talking about some things that don't make a lot of sense to us. We don't talk about prophecy a whole lot as a culture. Like, I don't remember the last time one of my friends was like, hey man, I had this crazy dream and there were all these beasts and these things were happening. Can you tell me what that's about and how this works in our life? Like, we don't, we don't do that. And as a culture, uh, we tend to shy away from prophecy because we don't understand it. Yet 25% of your Bible is prophecy. So it's really important that as a culture, we learn how to deal with prophecy and how to appropriately approach it. And so for every one mention of Christ's name for his first coming, the thing that's already happened, there are eight times that it talks about his future coming. So prophecy is important. Um, so I'm going to explain a few things. Uh, we're going to walk through the scripture. We're not going to get weird, and we're going to go for it. You guys ready? All right. So before we jump into seven, we're going to reflect back chapter one through six. We see a lot of awesome stories. Like Daniel is filled with some of the greatest stories in the entire Bible. 
We see Daniel in the lion's den. We hear about the fiery furnace and his three friends who are cast in there. And there's a fourth in the fire, the song we just sang about, right? So we see all these incredible stories. And Daniel is doing all this prophesy or interpretations of dreams for King Nebuchadnezzar. It's, it's awesome. And what, what I learned as I was researching for this message and what I think is really interesting is that when Daniel was originally written, he used to write in Hebrew. That was the language of the Israelites. So he would write chapter one in Hebrew. And this is to like set the stage for all of Daniel. Chapters two through six, Daniel changes the language he writes in and he writes in Aramaic, which is the language of Babylon. And the reason he does this is because Daniel wants to make a point that it is so important for us to learn what it looks like to be a light in the midst of the culture we live in, that he changes the entire language that he writes it in. In chapter seven, it's a little bit of a transition chapter where we go from Daniel talking to the people of God and how they're supposed to respond to the culture they're in, to be a light in that culture. And now he switches back to Hebrew in chapter eight. And really that sets the stage for God's people are su supposed to receive what I'm gonna communicate and apply it to their lives. And so there's a lot of awesome things we're gonna talk about today. We're gonna try to make sense of a lot of complicated things. So just stick with me. We're gonna make it easy in the end. So the primary thing I want you to understand about this piece of scripture is this, and I want you to write this down. These prophecies are meant to teach us about the future so that we know how to live in the present, okay? And this is true for most end time prophecy or what we call apocalyptic literature. It's not just meant for us to uh, look at when the end time is coming, but it's meant to go, how are we supposed to live in light of that today? Okay, so let's open up Daniel chapter seven, verse one. In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream and visions passed through his mind as he was lying in bed. He wrote down the substance of his dream. Daniel said, in my vision at night, I looked and there before me were four winds of heaven coming or churning up the great sea. Four great beasts, each different from the others, came up out of the sea. In Old Testament literature, oftentimes, the sea is a metaphor for the earth. So you see this churning in the earth, this chaos in the earth. And out of that comes these four beasts. And the beasts are often a metaphor for great kingdoms or empires. Okay, so beasts, empires, sea, the earth, they're being raised up. So I'm gonna have this chart up here for the rest of this time because it's gonna get a little, a little odd. We're gonna be talking about a lot of imagery, a lot of metaphor. So we're gonna try to clear it up. Verse four, the first was like a lion. The first beast was like a lion and it had the wings of an eagle. I watched until its wings were torn off and it was lifted from the ground so that it stood on two feet like a human and the mind of a human was given to it. So this first beast is the kingdom of Babylon. And if you remember in chapter four, Daniel chapter four, we see King Nebuchadnezzar, he has a dream, Daniel interprets it. He tells him, hey, this dream is about you and your kingdom. And if you don't change your ways, if you don't acknowledge God as the one true God, your kingdom is gonna be stripped from you. His wings are gonna be torn off and you're gonna become like-minded with an animal. And he literally wanders around and eats with animals for seven months. And at the end of that time, he comes to acknowledge God as the one true God. His kingdom is given back to him and he's given the mind of a man. So that's what we're talking about in chapter four, Babylon, or in verse four, Babylon. Verse five, and there before me was a second beast, which looked like a bear. It was raised up on one of its sides and it had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth. It was told, get up and eat your fill of flesh. The second beast is the Medo-Persian Empire, which would later conquer Babylon. We see this in Daniel. And we see this image of a bear that's kind of hunkered up on one side because the Medes and the Persians made this one empire. The Persians, which were much stronger than the Medes, ended up taking over the whole empire. So you have the Medes, which are like the lower part of the bear, and you have the Persians, which are the upper part of the bear. The ribs in their mouth, Babylon. So we see all this in chapter five. So we're gonna to move to verse six. After that, I looked and there before me was a third beast, another beast, one that looked like a leopard. 
and on its back it had four wings like those of a bird. The beast had four heads and it was given authority to rule. Well, this next beast, this leopard, this is Greece. And the leopard represents the speed at which Greece overtook the known world at that time, which was all prophesied before. That there would be this kingdom that rapidly overtook the entire known world. And this is under the leadership of Alexander the Great. And by the time Alexander the Great was 30 years old, he had conquered the entire known world. Which is pretty incredible how specific these prophecies are. The four wings that you see, the four heads that come out of this beast, what you see is later on, and we'll talk about this in a little bit, is that Alexander, when he dies, his kingdom split up into four kingdoms. Verse 7, after that, in my vision, at night I looked, and there before me was a fourth beast. It was terrifying, and it was frightening and very powerful. It had large iron teeth. It crushed and devoured its victims and trampled underfoot whatever was left. It was different from all the former beasts, and it had ten horns. Does anyone know what this last beast is? It's Rome. It's the Roman Empire. Oftentimes you see iron used as this like unbreakable force, and for a long time, over 600 years, we see Rome that just dominated everything. The ten horns and uh, represent this ability to inflict damage. The ability to just run over anything that it wanted to. And here's what's crazy about Daniel as you read through all of these prophecies, as you read through his vision here. They're incredibly specific and incredibly accurate. Each one of these beasts appeared and demised in the order in which Daniel had his vision. We see the lopsided bear take over uh, the Babylonian empire. We see the leopard take over... uh, Persia, so Greece taking over Persia, then we see Rome conquering Greek empire, and uh, this all happened hundreds of years after Daniel has this dream. So his prophecy was what we call precise. And when we talk about prophecy, specifically in the Old Testament, you're going to see a few things interweaved in prophecy. And the two things that you most often see is that you see that there is a near fulfillment, and you can write this down, of prophecy, and a far fulfillment of prophecy. So there's something specific that's going to occur, that's your near fulfillment, which you see in some of these kingdoms, and then you have a far fulfillment. And oftentimes what the far fulfillment does is it gives you a series of events that are reoccurring or a theme or something to be looked forward to in the future. So as we look at the rest of Scripture, I want, to, I want you to keep that in mind. Just the thought that this isn't just talking about the specific prophecy of what happens in Daniel's time, in Old Testament time, but this is also talking about a future far fulfillment of the prophecy as well. Okay, verse 8. We all track in? Okay, verse 8. Now while I was thinking about the horns, there before me was another horn. It was a little horn. So Daniel's like, wait, there's these huge horns, this giant beast. And for some reason, he fixates on this little horn that pops up. And he says, it came up among them. And the three of the first horns were uprooted before it. This horn had eyes like the eyes of a human being and a mouth that spoke boastfully. Now, I want to pause here for a minute because this is really important, this little horn. This is the first time in Scripture that we see the future prophecy of the Antichrist. This raising up of the spirit of evil. And and it's super specific in the sense that um, where it's going to be raised up from. But what I what I love about Daniel is when he can't fully understand something, he uses this term like. Right, like he's talking about these beasts and he's like, it was like this and it was like, like, I can't fully put words to what I'm seeing, but I'm trying to describe it to you. And what he says about this little horn is that it had eyes like a man. So I see a man, it looks like a man, but when you look into his eyes, there's something different. You don't see humanity. You see something dark. You see something evil. 
And so what I'm going to do this morning to paint a picture of this near fulfillment, this far fulfillment of Scripture and how this plays out in the Old Testament, um, if you guys will hold your spot in 7, you're going to flip over to Daniel 8. We're going to go down to verse 20. And as we do that, I'm going to give you a little background on verse, uh, on chapter 8. And, uh, and then we're going to continue there because there's something in chapter 8 that I want to point out to help you understand this concept of near and far fulfillment. In chapter 8, we have a very similar set of events. It's talking about the rise and fall of these empires. It's going through uh, this delineation of a ram and a goat, and the ram represents the Medo-Persian uh, empire that we talked about. The goat represents Alexander the Great and the kingdom of Greece. And we're going to start in verse 20. So it says, the two-horned ram that you saw represents the kings of the Medes and Persia. The shaggy goat is the king of Greece, and the large horn between its eyes is the first king, the first king, Alexander the Great. The four horns that replace that one that was broken off represent the four kingdoms that will emerge from his nation, but will not have the same power. So when Alexander the Great dies in his early 30s, um, there's this huge power struggle before, between four of his generals. And the kingdom of Greece gets split up into four different subcategories, which greatly weakens their power. So we continue. Verse 23, in the later part of the reign, when rebels have become completely wicked, a fierce looking king, a master of intrigue will arise. He will become very strong, but not by his own power. He will cause astand, or astounding devastation and will succeed in whatever he does. He will destroy those who are mighty, the holy people. He's talking about God's people. He will cause deceit to prosper. He will, he will consider himself superior. When they feel secure, he will destroy many and take his stand against the prince of princes. Yet he will be destroyed not by human power, So out of these four horns comes this little horn. And what we know from history is that around 170 BC, a man named Antiochus Epiphany came out from one of these subgroups of Greece. He's known as the Hitler of the Old Testament. This man, as he came into Jerusalem, slaughtered over 80,000 people in one day, women, children, he made coins of himself that said Antiochus, God in the flesh. And he put a statue in the middle of where uh, the temple was, the Holy of Holies, and forced the people to worship him. And I can't even begin to describe how offensive this was to them. This man was horrible. He fixated his destruction on what the south and the east, which is all prophesied ahead of time which in, from Greece, if you look at it, it, would have been Egypt and Israel. And so he attacked God's people. That was his sole focus. So as we saw in scripture, it's safe to say that Antiochus was the near fulfillment of chapter 8, verse 20 through 25 that he was a near fulfillment of that little horn, this guy who would raise up from this subgroup of Greece and be so destructive of, on God's people. It was so bad, the scripture calls it the abomination of desolation. And then out of nowhere, Antiochus develops his stomach flu and he dies. So just like was prophesied hundreds of years earlier, Antiochus dies, but not by human hands. And so the point of this is, is that there's a near fulfillment. The Antiochus was the near fulfillment of this part of chapter eight. But here's what's crazy. In Daniel chapter eight, it's referenced several times in the New Testament by Jesus, by John, and by Paul. And all three times that it's referenced, it references something that has yet to happen. It's pointing to the future is pointing to the second coming of Jesus. So there's still this far fulfillment that is yet to happen. So we have a near fulfillment and a far fulfillment. You guys tracking? All right, we're gonna flop back over to seven. So up until this point, this prophecy has like no hope, right? 
Like we see these beasts coming out of this chaotic world. They're all destroying each other. There's, there's murder, there's genocide. There's all these things happening in the world and we're about to see it all change. So let's start in verse nine. It says, as I looked, thrones were set in place and the ancient of days, this is the only part of scripture that uses ancient of days to describe God. He took his seat, his clothing was white as snow, his hair, the hair on his head was white like wool. His throne was flaming with fire and its wheels were all ablaze. A river of fire was flowing, coming out from before him and thousands upon thousands attended him. 10,000 times 10,000 stood before him. The court was seated and the books were open. We're talking about God's throne room, isn't that awesome? There is a king that is here that is present. In the ancient of days, I love that phrasing because what it's saying is there was no beginning to God. There is no end to God. There is nothing that he does not know. And he's about to cast his judgment. The word that uh, is translated here uh, for 10,000 times 10,000 isn't even a real number. We're talking about millions of people. It's trying to describe the immense amount of people who were there to just worship God. This is amazing. So he sits on his throne, in his throne, anything it passes over it engulfs with fire. What an incredible vision. Verse 11, then I continued to watch because even in the midst of all this happening, this throne room, the boastful words the horn was speaking. This little horn, he's still thinking that he has some type of power in the presence of the ancient of days. So I kept looking until the beast was slain and its body destroyed and thrown into the fire. As quickly as God spoke goodness into this world, he cast evil out of it. That's good news this morning, folks. This picture is a picture of when ultimate good meets ultimate evil and it's not even a contest. God doesn't get out of his throne to deal with this. He stays seated and he casts evil into the fire. Verse 13, it says, in my vision at night I looked and there before me was one like a son of man coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the ancient of days and was led into his presence. He was given authority, glory and sovereign power. All nations, all people of every language worshiped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. Can we get an amen this morning? These kingdoms, what we see through the scripture are built up and then they're destroyed, they don't last. Yet in the midst of any one of these moments, if you were to live in the time of Rome or you live when you feel like the US was at its greatest, there was no concept of like it not ever being there, right? Yet these kingdoms come and they go and there is only one that will last forever and that is the kingdom of God. And that's what Daniel's telling us. These four beasts, they raise up. It's not just about the near fulfillment, it's about the reality that we live in a, a world that will always have kingdoms that rise up and that will fall. But there is one kingdom that will never fail. And that's Jesus' kingdom. Isn't it amazing that Daniel has this, this vision of Jesus and he uses this, this term like again, right? Like he was like a man, he was like God, he wasn't just man, he wasn't just God, but like he was, right? And he was enthroned next to God and given all dominion and power. And so that's good news. There's three things I wanna take from the scripture today. As we look at this, it's not just about the fulfillment of then, but as we see at the end, it's about the fulfillment in the future and how we're supposed to live in this. So the first thing, the first conclusion I wanna take from this today is this, that there will be evil in this world until Jesus comes again. Nowhere does it say that evil is gonna be eradicated while we're still living here. And the reality is so many of you have experienced pain, you're watching what's happening in the world and you're like, God, what is going on? 
Where are you in the midst of this? Why, why does this continue to happen? Why don't we learn from these things? Well, we're told as long as there are kingdoms with leaders, then we're going to have pain and we're going to have suffering in this world. There's going to be conflict. There's going to be death and there's going to be suffering. Daniel saw it in his time and we continue to see it now. But there's good news. And the second thing is this, that God is present and working even in today's mess. And we can have confidence in that because we see it in Daniel. We see it when Daniel gets thrown into the lion's den, God's faithfulness. We see it when his three friends get cast into the fiery furnace and they're not alone. There's another in the fire with them and they come out unscathed. God is working all things together for good, even when it doesn't feel like it. And that doesn't mean that there isn't hurt and there isn't pain. In fact, you're gonna have hurt and you're gonna have pain, but God is using it and working in it, even when you can't see it. There will be a time when that fulfillment makes sense, but as long as we're living in this world, we're gonna deal with it. But we have one with us and God is close. He's a God who is near. You don't have to fight it alone. One of the things that I think is so fascinating as we look at this, this rise and fall of the empires and how God uses good in the, uses bad to create good is this. The Babylonian empire, when they took over, they destroyed Jerusalem, they burned it down. They destroyed the temple. It was horrible. Jews were dispersed throughout the land. Yet when Persia, who's considered even worse than Babylon, took into power, they paid in full for the rebuilding of Jerusalem. They paid in full for the rebuilding of the temple, which was gonna be a huge, huge place for Jesus' ministry. It was amazing. When the Greek took over, the Greek language was the first language that was used like unanimously across the land, which allowed the, langu- which allowed the gospel to be spread more rapidly than ever. Once Rome took over, they built roadways, they built passageways. Trading was at an all time high. The ability to get the gospel out was bigger then than it ever had been. God uses ugly, hard situations for good. And more than anything, if you look at the life of Jesus, the hopelessness you would assume someone would have on a cross, he defeated death. God uses hard things and ugly things for good. Your salvation is out of someone's pain and suffering. But the third thing, I want you guys to live in this, is that we live in the hope of Christ's future return today. Christians, we live with a hope. We're supposed to look different. Jesus lives within us, the Holy Spirit lives within us, and what he did so many years ago is meant to change us. Where we live today is our Babylon. What Daniel went through and what he was able to accomplish because of God working in him is the same thing we're supposed to accomplish in our community today. Your workplace, this country, your family, we're meant to look different to them. To not look like the world, to not conform to the things of this world, but to be different to show a kind of love, a kind of humility, a kind of grace that can only come from God. Daniel had no reason to be elevated into the leadership position that he was other than the fact that he just chose to honor God. So are you gonna be a Daniel in your Babylon? Because this world is filled with people who need Jesus. 
This world is filled with people who need hope, and God chose to use you to bring that hope to them. But that's only gonna happen if we choose to look different, if we choose to be used in such a way. If you're in here today and you're like, man, I'm one of those people that is just all about the end times prophecy. I can't stop thinking about how things work together and uh, which president is the antichrist. And you get so worked up and so worried about today and what your future is gonna look like. Let me ask you a question, why? Why? Would you really do much different if you knew tomorrow was gonna end? If it was gonna be the end of everything tomorrow, if Jesus was coming tomorrow, would you look different? Because if you would, you should look that way today. That's what it means to look different in this world. Live in the light that Jesus is coming today. Church, we've been entrusted with a lot. But the same God who raised Daniel up, who pulled him out of the den, who saved his friends from the fiery furnace is with you in the midst of your Babylon. If you're in here today and you've never made a decision to follow Christ, but you're experiencing the reality of this world, that there's pain, that there's suffering, that there's hurt. I want you to know that there is hope for you, that Jesus paid a price that only he could pay, that his death and resurrection was enough. We would love to talk with you. We'd love to pray with you. If you have questions and you're not at a place where you're like, man, I don't know if I believe what you guys believe, but I understand that this is a messy place and I don't know what's happen, gonna happen after I die. I don't know what, what things even look like after. We would love to talk with you. We'd love to pray with you. So as you came in today, there was a connect card that you were handed. You can fill that out. Let us know that you'd like to pray with the pastor, that you have questions, we'll get a hold of you. And maybe you're in here today and you're like, I'm ready to make that decision. After service is over, we're gonna have a prayer team up here. They would love to pray a prayer of salvation with you. They would love to walk with you in that. And guys, we're not promised anything except that there's gonna be pain until Jesus comes again, but that he is coming again. So let's live as if it is today. Let's live in such a way where we don't know if tomorrow is coming because we're not promised it. We're just promised that there will be a day when ultimate good conquers ultimate evil. But we can live in that light today. Let's pray. God, I just thank you for the truth that we can pull out of scripture that can be so foreign for us, God. I thank you for your goodness and your faithfulness that we can see weaved all throughout Daniel's story, through the, the scripture that we read today, God, that you are faithful even in the midst of hard seasons and ugly seasons, God. You're working it all together for your good. And even though uh, we don't know how that always plays out, that we can trust in you because you were faithful then and you'll be faithful now. God, we can have confidence in the future because of what you've done in the past. So God, would you help us to live in such a way that people would experience your hope, that they would experience your goodness God, would we be a light in the world today like Daniel was to Babylon and to Greece? God, would we be a light in our Babylon today? Father, we love you and we pray this in your son's name. Amen. If you made a decision this morning, would you let us know?
Would you pull out that Connect card, check that box, maybe you made a first-time decision. Maybe you decided that it's time for you to get baptized and you want to check that box. Just let us know. We'd love to be praying for you. Uh, like Kason said, after service, we're going to have a prayer team right up front here. We'd love to pray for you. If you're tuning in online, just click the Connect button on our website and let us know, and we'll be praying for you as well. Um, I also want to invite you, if you are newer to Stonehill or you've never been to a first step, we have first step this afternoon um, at Stonehill HQ. All the information is on your handout uh, right here. And this is just a great opportunity for you to be able to meet the staff, be able to learn about Stonehill's core values and beliefs, and to find ways that you can get plugged in here at Stonehill. Uh, for those of you that have been a part of Stonehill for a long time, I want to thank you for being just here and being faithful and serving and, and giving. Um, we really, really appreciate it. We have the opportunity to be able to reach out into our community and look different uh, because of that. So I want to encourage you to continue to seek God in all of your giving, whether that's financial or your time, um, whatever that looks like. Just seek His will first. Um, once again, thank you guys so much for being here. We're going to have connect uh, the baskets being passed uh, during this next song where you can drop the Connect card in there on the way by. So I want to invite everyone to go ahead and stand up on your feet and let's continue to worship together.
Let's give him praise this morning and thanks. Hey, well, thank you all for joining us today. Remember, if you guys need prayer for anything, we have our prayer team that will be down in the front over here. So we hope you guys have an amazing week. We'll see you all next week.